Hello, my name's Christine Stenquist. Um, thank you for your patience, and thank you for having me, Annie. Thank you for inviting me to come out here to California. I truly, truly appreciate it. It's been an amazing day and a half so far. It's, you know, it's, it's been an, an amazing experience for me. Um, like she said in my bio, I've been bedridden and housebound for two decades, and if you would bear with me for a little bit, I'm going to tell you about that journey and what it looked like for me. Um, in 1996, I was diagnosed with an acoustic neuroma, which is a, a brain tumor that sits on your equilibrium nerve, my facial nerve, and my hearing nerve. At the time, I was 24 years old. I was a mother of a five-year-old and a three-year-old. I worked at Lakeview Hospital, which is a little tiny hospital in uh, Bountiful, Utah. I was uh, setting out my five-year plan. I was about to get into nursing school, setting down a path. And that's when the diagnosis happened. I was walking specimens from the emergency room to the lab, and I had a shot of pain shoot across my face, and I... I called out to a colleague, and I passed out. I woke up in the emergency room, surrounded by my colleagues, and was now a patient. During the course of testing, they discovered what kind of tumor it was, and the location of the tumor was close enough to my brain stem that they felt surgery was important. And so I went into surgery. I was given a month to get my affairs in order. Um, because of the risk of the surgery, and this being 20 years ago, and not a lot of people doing a lot of acoustic neuroma surgeries, they told me I had a 50% chance. So at 24, I had to figure out who in my family I wanted to raise my children and what that was gonna look like for them. Sorry, it's been an incredibly emotional day and a half. <laughs> and reliving this is deeply personal, but the journey I have had in discovering and the human connections I've had along the way have been worth all the pain. The night of surgery, I didn't sleep. I instead spent my, what I thought might be my last waking hours on this plane of existence, watching my babies sleep. I went outside and I walked the grounds of my apartment complex and I enjoyed the stars. Because I didn't know if 24 years is all I got. Very angry about my predicament, I humbled myself, prayed to my higher power, and said, please just get me through this surgery. I want more time with my babies. I need more time. I'll be whatever tool the universe needs me to be. Be careful what you bargain for. During surgery, they hit a blood vessel. They had only removed 40% of the tumor. And I hemorrhaged, and I slipped into a coma. I stroked, and I was there for four days, in between space and reality. I had my own personal experience, near-death experience, and that is another topic. But I did wake and I was really mad I had not shaved my legs. For those of you who do <laughs> shave your legs, after four days, it got really long, it felt like. But I woke, and I knew I had a lot of therapy to go through, because at the time, I still had slurred speech. I had stroked, so I had a lot of left side weakness. I had to use a walker for a number of months. But this meant that I could not go back to the workforce. I had to apply for disability. I went on state housing, I went on food stamps. My pride was broken.
that's okay. A lot of us go through health crisis that we don't anticipate. But this began the journey of 16 years of suffering. I've been on over 45 different types of pharmaceutical drugs. I've had nerve ablations done. I've had trigger point injections done. To no avail, I've been in and out of pain clinics. I've been in and out of the hospital because they put you on so much opioids and you hit a ceiling and you gotta come down. So you have that little wiggle room when you have those pain flares. So while I don't consider myself addicted to opiates, my body was so dependent. It was extremely dependent. And going through those withdrawals was horrific, especially when you know you might have to do this again in another year and a half. That went on for 16 years. It's been a journey. <laughs> This leads me to 2012 when I hit another pain wall. This one was just too much. At the time, I was on a fentanyl patch. My breakthrough shots were dilated. I wasn't eating. They were talking about feeding tubes. I was just not in a very good state of mind. I was emotionally just broken. My children were raised by a ghost of a mom. I just wasn't present. I turned to my physician and I told him, I want to try cannabis to see if I can get my nausea under control so I can take those beautiful pills that you keep giving me. And he said, don't do anything illegal. Let me send you to another pain clinic. He sent me to another pain clinic and this pain clinic started me on a medication called Marinol, synthetic THC. At first, and I say at first, in the first few days, I got some mild relief, but it didn't take long for those side effects to kick in, and I couldn't do it. So I started learning a little bit more about this Marinol I was on, and it led me down a path on the internet, finding blogs and other patients who said, stay away from that stuff. Whole plant access is what you need. Whole plant access, I don't even know what that means. What is whole plant access to what? What are you talking about? Well, you gotta have all the cannabinoids. What the hell is a cannabinoid? What, what is, I, like, I had to learn a whole new lexicon. There was a whole new world out here about plant therapy that I knew nothing about at all. I wasn't raised around it. Many of you guys might remember in the 80s is when we started to move towards, 80s and 90s, towards pharmaceuticals being advertised on television. That's the generation I grew up in. Healthcare changed drastically when it became marketable. In finding alternatives to this Marinol, discovering cannabis, discovering the history, not only that, when I say history, I talk, I, once I realized that cannabis had all these medicinal properties, I couldn't understand, well, why is it prohibitive then? And that's when you start learning about the history and the drug war which meant that I needed to have a conversation with somebody. And it had to do with this. What is a weed? <laughs> I found something that might potentially help me and I wanted to use it. So I needed to have a conversation with my father, who was an undercover narcotics officer in Miami. <laughs> That's a nice 70s picture. I spared the, go the goatee and long haired ones. Um, so I did approach my dad. I gave him a call and I said, Dad, I've discovered that cannabis might be a better avenue for me and I wanna try it, what do you think? And without skipping a beat, he says, you should do it, Chrissy. Absolutely, you should try it. He lives in Florida and at the time in Florida, there was a dialogue in the village, which is our retirement where all our snowbirds from up north come and retire about cannabis. There was a gentleman down there who was doing a, su a silver tour, going around to nursing homes, <laughs> handing out medicated brownies. <laughs> so my father had heard about this, this thing happening in Florida. He's like, Chrissy, you should try it. And I said, but dad, I'm in a state where it's not legal. He's like, yeah, I bet you can find a bag somewhere. 
pretty sure Utah, I know it's Utah, but I bet they have cannabis there somewhere. That led me to having a conversation with my husband. How do we find cannabis? <laughs> like, how do we go about finding marijuana? So I turned to my 19 year old <laughs> and I said, um, honey, do any of your friends smoke weed? And it's not like what you think. I need some. <laughs> and she said, yes. And I said, well, because this is the thing. There's a stuff called spice that I can go to at the smoke shop and everybody's saying it's like cannabis. And so it's legal. I'm going to go try that. And it was, mommy, don't do that. Let me get my friend over here and she'll help you. So I got another education from a teenager <laughs> about cannabis. And from there, we learned how to acquire our bags. And I went through that whole process. Within moments of trying cannabis, after getting our first bag, I got relief from my nausea. Somebody in the medical field wanting to go into nursing, I started documenting my progress. Because I thought it was kind of a fluky thing. I thought maybe you're just stoned. <laughs> it's not really that. So I started documenting every time I took a hit of, off a bowl, I wrote down its effects and how long it lasted. After two weeks of doing this, I was starting to walk again. Just to take you back, I was in a bedridden situation where I wasn't eating and wasn't walking. My husband was carrying me to the bathroom and bathing me. Two weeks, I was using my cane around the house, walking again, getting my strength back. Now, cannabis isn't a panacea. What it provided me Personally, is it mitigated my symptoms so that I could start eating and sleeping and keeping hydration in me. So it aided in a whole body experience. I'm very careful about, in, in Utah, not saying it's a cure-all. Nobody likes that kind of language and it's very, I think, not completely truthful about what's going on when you have plant-based medicine involved. So as I started to get relief from this, I knew I had to have another conversation, and that was with my children, on what mommy's funny smelling smoke was coming out of her room, and what that meant, and what that meant for us moving forward. Again, this is 2012, and I cannot remember how many states we had at that time. I think we only had 20 states that had medical cannabis at the time. Um, Utah was nowhere near being one of them. So this was a conversation of, we can't talk to the neighbors about this. We're gonna to have to limit who can come over to the house because there's gonna be this funny incense odor. To remind you, I'm from Utah. For those of you who don't know anything about Utah, it's heavily populated by Mormons or um, people who are affiliated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Very, very conservative um, group of individuals. It it's permeates the entire culture. Um, so when we talk about when we talk about not having people come over to our house, it's individuals that generally are of that faith, and just the smell of smoke is is off-putting, and you can imagine that Miramar might be even worse. So it became a very isolating period of time as I was healing and using cannabis, as I realized that smoking wasn't always the best method for me for my lungs. I started moving towards vaporizing. Um, I've been diagnosed with multiple things. I also have trigeminal neuralgia, which is a pain condition that affects the face. My V1, my V2, and my V3 nerves feel like a severe ice cream headache all the time. Constant pain, nerve burning, chewing can trigger it, the wind blowing can trigger attacks that are really debilitating on the way here. Um, just getting out of the car, the wind came by, and it stopped me dead in my tracks. The pain is unpredictable. It's also dubbed the suicide disease. Um, before I had decided to try cannabis, I had found myself in the emergency room. Because I had taken a blade to myself. Because I could no longer endure the pain. So I didn't come to cannabis lightly. Now that I saw that this plant was doing miraculous things for my health, six months I started driving, 
hadn't been driving in so long. Eight months after that, I found my way to Capitol Hill because I'll be damned if any other patient in my state had to suffer like I had been suffering. Thank you. So now what? I gotta figure out how to pass legislation so, so I could um, show my children that when you see an unjust law, you have to change it. You don't just sit idly by. You stand up and you say something. So how do you do it? Because I tell you what, it's much different than the Schoolhouse Rock video. <laughs> the song and dance on the steps did not work. <laughs> I figured out where I needed to start was somewhere I was not even at, social media. And here's why. My patients are ill. The people I was trying to reach were just like me. They were isolated in a bedroom away from society and culture and everything. The only thing they really were connecting them was social media. So through social media, which I had to learn, my teenagers said, Mom, you gotta get connected to the world now. I hadn't been on social media until 2012. Nothing. MySpace, I didn't have to suffer that. I went right past it. <laughs> right past it, didn't even know what it was. So I'm on Facebook, my son starts teaching me how to find other groups. So I'm going into MS groups, because at one point in time that was a diagnosis. <laughs> I went into um, pain management groups. I went into Parkinson's group. I went into epilepsy groups. I went into every group, patient group I could think of. And in the top, I search engine in cannabis, pot, weed. And anybody who had an intelligent comment about cannabis got a message from me. It said, hey, I'm a brain tumor patient and I'm forming a group of people who might be interested in passing legislation here in Utah. Are you interested? Sometimes they said no, sometimes they referred me to somebody, sometimes they said yes. And I started building a coalition of people. Dropped them all into a Facebook, stick a label on us, and we started advocating on the Hill. That's, that's the process of what we thought was gonna happen. But we need more people on board. I had to form an organization that people could get under, a banner, something that wasn't viewed as outsider. In Utah, they do not like anything national. They don't like anybody, any other organization. So when I went looking for help, like Drug Policy Alliance, I went to, uh, I didn't go to MPP, but MPP's out there for policy. Um, there's all these other different groups. Um, SSDP was um, the Students for Sensible Drug Policy were in our, in our state. That's who I found first, but I couldn't quite relate because I, at the time, was a 40-year-old woman and these were much younger individuals and I wasn't feeling like I was connecting there. So I started this nonprofit, um, very organic, together for responsible use in cannabis education, just trying to get people to come together because the goal was I needed Republicans, I needed Democrats, I needed Libertarians, I needed Green Partiers, I needed atheists, I needed theists, I needed people who were members of the church who weren't members of church. It was a time to drop labels. No labels were allowed in my group because we had one goal, one common goal. Let's see if we can get cannabis legislation passed in Utah. And these were the four pillars we're going to teach our community about cannabis because there's a whole deep history about how it became prohibitive. And that's something people needed to understand that it was politically motivated. It was in our pharmacology in the 1800s and then got drastically demonized during the 1930s. A lot of people in my, in my world didn't know that. I didn't know that. My father's a narcotics fa uh, officer. I didn't hear this dialogue. I didn't know this history. So for me, as I pulled patients in, I was curating articles and there was like mandatory reading. <laughs> like, read this article read this, and in our community, we educated each other on history, on policy. Nixon came along, <laughs> and what he did to the drug war, and the racism around that that happened. When you start teaching people, when you educate them, a light bulb goes off. 
they become hungry for more. We started teaching them about science, about Dr. Raphael Mishulam, and not just him, Ethan Russo. There's so many others. I mean, there's, there's just so much information out there. It just wasn't being pulled together. And we put all that information in how it relates to patients. We've gotten away from plant medicine. We've heard a lot about that tonight and yesterday. And that's what we wanted to get back to was, this is for patients. We need to start thinking along those lines. So we started advocating on the Hill. I'm gonna take you through my photo album. I document everything. I am a brain injury patient. I need these moments frozen in time. <laughs> so I don't forget the journey. Because it's been truly, truly amazing. I love the patients that I have found, or rather that found me, because I feel like there is a vortex of energy that's been going in Utah, and we all just sort of found each other at the right time to create such a beautiful movement. So I found, like I told you, Parkinson's patients. I found pain patients, MS patients, mothers, fathers, all kinds of people were coming out of the word works. I was having them come up to the Capitol during the session almost every day. That's some of them up in the gallery. That is the day that we passed out of the Senate. And the Senate president knows that I had been bringing those patients every day and he allowed us the moment to cheer, which is not really given an opportunity for people to be that vocal. And we yelled and it's just the most amazing thing, that poor woman up in the corners. Watching these cancer patients come up to the Capitol and be so proud to be able to tell their story and have their legislators shake their hand and thank them for coming up there and then feeling a sense of purpose you don't understand. When you're sick and you're ill, you feel like nothing but a drain on your community and on society and on the healthcare system. To be able to give a little bit of yourself, a little bit of your story to this collective energy that can push policy in a state, it felt like purpose. And we lose that when we become ill. We forget that there is still a reason why we exist. So being up there and doing these efforts did amazing things in our state. We raised the bar of consciousness. And I have to, these guys have their heads buried in the sand. It's just, they don't, they don't know what's going on. They have a very, very closed, uh, they're not exposed to a lot. I think a lot of it is just that they're not exposed to different. And um, they were learning. We didn't pass anything the first two years that I started advocating. Um, I don't know how many of you follow the cannabis movement, but in 2014 is when I showed up on the Hill. And at the time in Utah, there was a CBD bill. This is the beginning of the CBD only movement and I apologize. At the time, I was still using my cane and I was going up to the session. I hadn't formed my coalition yet, it was me by myself and epilepsy moms who were fighting for CBD oil. I showed up to tell them that THC is not recreational and that there's a whole cannabinoid profile that they're missing out on. And not only that, nobody's talking about terpenes. Like, you guys are missing a whole bunch of science. And these moms said, please don't do this. We just want to get this passed. All we need is CBD. You can come back next year and fight for whatever you need. And I said, but what you're doing is fracturing a movement by demonizing one part of the planet, saying the other part is, is only medicinal, is you're hurting all of us, including your son, including your daughter. I know you think you're, you're convincing the most conservative among this that this is okay, but it'll hurt us in the long run. I was silenced and asked to wait. I watched as 2014 Utah became the first CBD only state in the union. While people cheered and thought it was an accomplishment, my heart broke. I was written out of that bill. 
It dwindled down to only two types of epilepsy that could even access it. And not only that, they didn't even write a bill so that patients could procure, procure medication in the state. There was no brick and mortar. It was just a get out of jail free card, but you're gonna have to travel to Colorado to get it and then travel back in the state. It was a nightmare of policy work, all because they wanted something that made them feel good, like that they were doing something good and protecting the community, but it wasn't based in science, it wasn't based in logic, and in the end it hurt and delayed a lot of things for patients. So I knew we had to continue our efforts. An organization reached out to me when they saw the efforts I was making in Utah and said, you should come to DC and lobby. You're doing great stuff there. We're working on policy efforts here on trying to move legislation. I said, sure, I'll come. Got a chance to meet Cory Booker. I got to uh, meet some of my legislators that I have met, um, our congressional delegation, um, Orrin Hatch, Mike Lee, on there. They, this, this was an interesting experience for me being somebody who hadn't been exposed to politics, who'd been a bit sheltered for two decades, to have these gentlemen listening to what I was trying to explain to them. But I could tell that there were still some limitations on wanting to understand or believing. So 2016, I left, but I was able to get Mike Lee on a bipartisan bill with Cory Booker, Gillenbrand, and Rand Paul. They're still on that bill. It's still up on the, on the hill with about other 50 other pieces of cannabis legislation right now. But that was an amazing moment for me because I got to meet other patients and caregivers from across the country and got to hear more of the same trials that I was going through and trying to convince your typical opposition. The Utah, for me, it was the Utah Medical Association. Medical associations in other states were pushing back. Law enforcement was always pushing back. And of course, I had the church in my state having to push back. Um, we really have the LDS church really dominates the politics there. And it's, it's, it's overt. It's, it's not, even, not even mildly kinda they do. No, it's, it's overt. And um, to the point that it, it can be very devastating if it's an issue that they don't like. I don't know, LGBTQ? Anybody, I mean, Prop 8 was huge. Like, so cannabis wasn't their favorite thing. They kept shutting us down legislatively in my state, and I finally decided, well, we're gonna have to do a ballot initiative. That's, that's our only solution. So the group of us, with along of, um, some of our allies, we had Libertas Institute, which is a libertarian think tank in Utah. We came together and we formed Utah Patients Coalition, which ran the campaign. It was a group of patients and caregivers, and then it just infected the whole state. So many of us came together. We were polling at 78% in favor of medical cannabis in Utah last year at this time. It was phenomenal. Just to give you some perspective, when I showed up on the scene in 2014, one, I was told it's never gonna happen in Utah, and never tell me never. And two, we only were pulling at 51% support to go from 51 to 78 in three years was amazing, it was absolutely amazing. That means our messaging was working, it was happening. But we have what we call a weak initiative state and the process in trying to pass a ballot initiative has some hoops that you have to jump through. We have 29 Senate districts. You need 26 out of the 29. You need 10% of the voters. You need 113,000 signatures across the state. They really put some rigor on us. When we filed, we knew that that was gonna be the obstacle. We didn't have a big campaign. When we put it up that we had filed, we had over 2,000 volunteers within 24 hours hit our email. That is phenomenal. <laughs> Across the state. It was amazing. We have a lot of patients who were supporters, but we weren't going to risk just doing volunteers. Though we probably could have done quite a bit. We weren't going to risk patients' health. It was them that were volunteering. They were desperate. We hired a, a signature gathering service, but we also had 
incredible volunteers. That's one of our county commissioners. I pulled from everywhere into my group. I have people who are senators. I have people who are commissioners, teachers, firefighters, law enforcement that are part of truce. And what they do within truce is they become their own heroes in their own counties, in their own, own political circles. They're tasked with just having this conversation at the kitchen table at any opportunity. That's all I want is plant the seed. And then it's your job to nurture it in your garden. I don't need to be the hero of Utah. I just want to teach you how to plant those seeds and why you need to keep planting those seeds. So we have a ton of people across the state who really bought into this initiative. It became the people's initiative. When they found out that the cannabis people were filing, Medicaid expansion called me, said, hey, we're gonna file too. And so they filed, Medicaid expansion filed, Better Boundaries filed. We had four initiatives last year. That's phenomenal for Utah, for the people to rise up and said, this is what we want. And it all stemmed from our medical cannabis movement. We gave voice to the people becoming empowered. It moved quickly into a, a very tumultuous campaign. We used some of the LDS Church's scriptures. <laughs> This was done by an anonymous voter. And it caused such controversy, the church was furious. Can you see it? It says, all wholesome herbs God hath ordained of the use of man, for the use of man. This is LDS scripture. It was a reminder, pun intended, of our roots. This is where we needed to go and we needed to, to penetrate. So, the church got involved. I'm going to take up the question time because you've got to hear the rest of the story. The church was very upset with me that we had gotten to this far, but I knew that we were going to have to fix the policy that was going to be passed that November, last November. So I reached out, asked if they would sit with us. They sat with us. They said, what is it you want? If this is going to pass, what do you need from us? And I said, well, policy needs to work, so we need to engage together. They said, no, war is coming, and we're probably going to spend 5 to $10 million to drop Prop 2. We're going to stop it. There was no way they can stop it. It was on the ballot. It was going to be up to the people. So they put out an attack campaign. They pulled a lot of our LDS people away because the church came out against a specific policy. And it's really hard when you deal with people who's, who in their mind are fighting for their salvation and you're putting them against policy. It's a very hard dichotomy for those individuals to deal with. And we lost a lot of people from my group. I lost almost my entire executive board. We were comprised half LDS, half not. That was important to me, that we had that balance. Some of the people in that, that uh, picture are no longer with our group anymore. The church held a press conference, and what you see right there is us at the press conference. We were being barred for being allowed to attend. They were saying we couldn't come in when they were about to tell the entire state, no, we don't support, support patients having access through this means. Those were the patients and I being left out. And while we were in the press conference, a mother's holding her child who went into a seizure episode. As the church, law enforcement, the government, and the financial powers in the state stood on a mighty stage filled and told us no. We stood there, and some of us in that picture you can see have our backs turned to those who turned their backs on us. We're a very controlled group. We're not the type that raises hands or shakes fists. We're kind of shaking hands. And this was a powerful movement for us. We tried to be very contained. We kept fighting. We kept winning. More and more people were saying they were going to vote for Prop 2 no matter what. Then there was a, a, a talk of a replacement bill coming. Even if Prop 2 passed, the legislative body, the church, said that they were going to come in and undermine our initiative. And they did just that. But before that, we won on election night. Yeah. 
It was amazing. They told us we couldn't do it. That's my vice chair that's flipping everybody off. <laughs> and she's LDS. <laughs> they said we couldn't do it. They said when I showed up in 2014, that's cute, Christine, but that's not possible here. We'll be the last state in the union. And we weren't the last state in the union, but I'm still fighting. They did have a special session. They did come in and replace our bill. The state now is currently trying to dispense cannabis through our health departments. Yes, oh, who said what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a schedule one substance. They're risking their federal funding for their health departments because they wanna play drug cartel. They took the free market away from the people they have limited licensing. I only have seven private dispensaries in the entire state to serve 3.1 million people. And the way they wrote their law, those dispensaries have to be in the most heavily populated area, which means Wasatch Front. That means everybody that's in central Utah and east is not gonna be serviced and they can't grow. And they can't grow. They're gonna be so far away from, st I'm livid, I'm still fighting. So what I did, I filed a lawsuit. <laughs> we brought in 78,000 new registered voters to Utah. And they showed up and they are pissed that their vote was undermined. And they were very upset. So who you see behind me, Doug Rice is the president of the Epilepsy Association. That was the patient's group that was behind the CBD only movement. When he came, became president, I reached out to him and I said, help me fix this sickness that has invaded our entire country with this CBD only stuff. We've got to teach them the right science. He said, absolutely. He's been on my side ever since. He joined me in the lawsuit. So the Epilepsy Association of Utah, truce, Myself personally and Doug personally have joined this lawsuit fighting the governor and the health department. We're trying to win our vote back. So one thing that I learned through all this process is this. When suffering is the human condition, let compassion be the cure. I taught my state how to be compassionate again. I taught them how to be compassionate again. I have never seen a movement sweep like I saw this one. This, this crossed barriers. Our country has become so vitriolic in our politics. It's very easy to get caught up in these friend types of things. But when I was at tabling events and I saw a Democrat and a Republican at the same table gathering signatures and talking to patients about cannabis, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. We can heal our country again if we have some compassion. Thank you so much for letting me be here today. Thank you. Thank you. I am happy to take any questions you might have. Yes, ma'am. I lived in Utah back in the mid 80s and I wasn't a drinker at the time. I did discover alcohol though there. And do they still? Uh, control all of the alcohol sales and 10% goes directly to education. Mm -hmm. That's, they do. The, um, it's called the DABC, the Department of Alcohol Bureau Control. And what they're trying to do with cannabis is effectively the same thing. The state has a central distribution site and they distribute alcohol to all the liquor stores throughout the state. What they're trying to do with cannabis is effectively the same thing, but they want to use the health departments to do it. The problem is we can't do money transactions, it's still illegal. So we're still same control, still same control. Any other? Thank you so much. I actually just recently read about you online. And so it's amazing to see you in person and feel your story. I'm wondering what we in California can do. How can we help? 
always can donate to my nonprofit. Truce is, is doing this lawsuit. We're trying to fund it ourselves. And um, people don't want to throw money at cannabis. It's a very risky thing. Um, but supporting education groups like myself really help. If you guys are connected to the cannabis community, please come get my card, let's talk. I know that there is education that needs to be done. I am trying and working with the larger medical institutes in Utah to get educated on cannabis. We're talking about throwing a medical, a professional cannabis conference. We wanna get our doctors, our nurses, our nurse practitioners educated. They've been isolated from this. They need to understand. And, and honestly, it's not just with Utah. I am getting people in a lot of conservative states who are reaching out to me now saying, please come to my state and teach me. Please come to my state and help me. What I would say to Californians, you guys have been dealing with this issue for a lot of years. Reach out to these conservative states. Follow some of these groups online and extend a helping hand. They may be reluctant at first because they don't know. I was nervous meeting other fellow advocates, especially because they were so much radical -er than I was. But what I'm trying to do with truce, what I'm trying to do is make it normalized for conservatives. I, want, I wanted to create an organization that my grandmother could Google and go onto the website and not feel embarrassed or ashamed or anything. That meant a little bit of removing cannabis flowers away from my website because it was still a trigger. The cannabis flower, the cannabis leaf is still viewed as a, a sign of rebellion. And so for me to get people in my conservative area to understand the message, I had to remove some of the, the emotionally charged symbols. So getting that out of the way and starting to move into the educating really helped. But honestly, the answer I would say is reach out to those fellow advocates and just offer a helping hand, you know? Please let me give you my card. <laughs> we need all the help we can get. Thank you so much. We're so glad we invited you to come.